certainly. Doing more tests, ray tracing, wavefront, slows down the preoperative process, but fundamentally, it's worth it. It's okay to take more time if it gets better results. I mean, we're creating results that are good for a lifetime. Who cares if it takes an extra half hour? Obviously, we have to recapture the effort in a higher price, but people will pay a higher price for a safer procedure. So yes, but it's no problem. I'm skeptical that better biometry is gonna give us a greater range. For example, could we treat plus four hyperopes well if we had better wavefront or better biometry? I don't think so. LASIK just doesn't work very well at either end of the range or for high cylinder. So better biometry is a great way to improve our outcomes, but I don't think it'll give us a bigger range. That's gonna be reserved for other procedures. I'm not sure we can eliminate photic phenomenon by improving our lasers or our measurements. Uh, we know that to some degree, night glare after LASIK is due to spherical aberration. And whenever you flatten the cornea without changing its periphery, there's gonna be some spherical aberration. Larger optical zones probably will help. Smoother surfaces probably will help. But I'm not sure we'll ever completely transit the problem that the cornea is flatter in the middle and steeper at the periphery. Topography right now is pretty good, but the data is fairly noisy. And so topography systems deal with that by smoothing the data a fair amount. That means there is a significant loss of detail in our current topography systems. Nevertheless, that's important because otherwise you get extraneous topographic features that aren't really there. So yes, topography can be improved. On the other hand, how much will that help us? Will it better allow us to detect subclinical keratoconus? Perhaps. Or perhaps that, which is really in a sense where the topography is most important, maybe that's going to be done with epithelial thickness maps or anterior segment OCT. It's a question I think we haven't answered yet. It's important not to confuse the method of measuring aberrations with the aberrations themselves. There are different ways to measure aberrations. hartman shack ray tracing. I'm not sure which of those is going to be the way they should be measured in the future, whether or not that's going to be ray tracing or another method. But I do believe that measuring aberrations gives better outcomes. And we have good evidence for that from the data of Edward Manchi at Stanford and others in randomized trials that that measuring aberrations pre-op seems to give better results post-op. We have gotten much better at screening for coronal ectasia in the last five years. We're more cautious about topography. We're doing other modalities like anterior segment OCT. We may be doing epithelial thickness mapping widely in the future. We've also recognized that there are risk factors for coronal ectasia, so we're even more cautious in very young people. This is also an area where big data has been helpful. We found, for example, from the Steve Shalhorn's data in Optical Express that, yes, while young people are, people are at a higher risk for ectasia after keratoconus, that risk is still very low, and it's certainly in the range where it's acceptable, where these people are still good candidates if everything else is normal. Artificial intelligence is the topic du jour, and it's being way over-promoted. It isn't the next best thing since sliced bread. So what artificial intelligence is very good for is if you have a gigantic number of input variables to distill out a few output variables. So it's very good for analyzing images, like retinal images, where you have four megapixels of input data and you want to know whether or not there's diabetic retinopathy or macular generation gigantic number of input variables, a few outputs. Artificial intelligence is not very good where you have a few input variables, like in refractive surgery, age, refraction, uh, uh, aspherosity, coma, you can imagine what might be, and you have a huge amount of data. That's much better handled with traditional statistics. So I'm not sure artificial intelligence will be that useful in refractive surgery unless 
what we're doing is actually feeding surgical videos into an artificial intelligence program. There it's like a thousand images in sequence and figuring out what little things we're doing in our surgical technique that make a difference in the outcome. For example, opaque bubble layer. That's where it could be useful, but yes, yeah, nobody's doing that. Um, our enhancement rate has dropped dramatically over the next two decades. It's now in the 4% range in my practice, and I think that's pretty standard in, in premium practices. It doesn't seem to be dropping much further. And that concerns me a little bit because a 4% rate of enhancements is still in a sense a 4% failure rate. That's a minor failure, but I'd much rather see our enhancement rates less than 1%. I think to do that we need better measuring devices than manifest refraction. I think wavefront analysis ultimately is going to be the way we get the precise measurements needed to squeeze our enhancement rate down to less than 1%. The traditional mechanical microkeratome is dead and buried. The femtosecond laser macrokeratome is alive and well and certainly the way of the future.